Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talking History Online with the History Trust of South Australia. Um, tonight, we have a fascinating um, look at Adelaide's new Holocaust Museum. And we have two amazing speakers with us tonight in Kathy Bakich and Pauline Cockrell. Um, but we are still, as always, um, when you first join us, we're waiting for everyone to join in. It takes a few minutes to get everyone in. So um, while we're waiting, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to do an acknowledgement of country and then run through some housekeeping for uh, this evening's webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've seen in the chat already, there's um, at least a couple of, of new people joining us tonight. Uh, we hold Talking History every, every month and since COVID hit, we've been online. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Christy Kokigi, the Director of Public Engagement at the History Trust. And I'd like to acknowledge that this land that we're broadcasting on tonight is the land of the Ghana people and that I'm personally coming to you from, from Ghana land. Uh, but also that the History Trust of South Australia respects the primary place of Aboriginal people in the history of this place and that we acknowledge our story commenced long before Governor Highmarsh and the new province of South Australia um, proclaimed, sorry, long before High Marsh proclaimed the, the new province of South Australia and, and established colonial government in 1836. Um, and that uh, Aboriginal people have a long history that extends millennia into the past. We acknowledge that Aboriginal land and sovereignty were not recognised uh, in 1836 and that building a shared understanding of our history is crucial to reconciliation and creating a positive future for all of us here in South Australia. Okay, so just while we're still waiting for some people to join us tonight, um, the format for this evening, this is a webinar for those of you who haven't been um, to a Talking History before. The webinar means that uh, you are all muted and there is no, we can't see you, you don't have video, you can see us panellists. Um, so the best way to interact with us and with our speakers is to jump on the chat. It's really lovely for our speakers at the end to, to have a look at the chat, see where you're all joining in from and, and read some of your uh, comments as, as we go through this evening. It's a really nice way to, to sort of create a bit of a community around talking history um, and to provide that feedback to our speakers when you're talking uh, in a webinar format, you're staring at a screen and not being able to see the audience um, can be difficult. So please jump on the chat, ch tell us where you're coming from. Uh, now, also on that chat, make sure, oh, if you want to just talk to us panellists, that's fine. But, but if you can, make sure that you choose where it says to, make sure that you're choosing everyone rather than just hosts and panellists. And that way you can talk to everyone else who's in the room. Um, the lecture tonight... Great, so we've also got some interstaters. Um, what's one of the, the beauties of, I mean, you know, there's some, some silver linings to COVID, not very many, but, but since we took Talking History Online uh, in 2020, we've, we've been able to, we, we, we've been joined by people nationally and internationally at every one of our talks. So it's really amazing to see, see the reach of Talking History since we went online. So, Certainly, as we look to shift back to in-person talking history ne sessions next year, we will continue to live stream these as well because, um, you know, being able to, to reach out nationally and internationally uh, to these audiences is fabulous. Now, oh, there we go. We've even got international. Thank you very much. Great. Everyone keep putting your, um, tell us where you are coming from, from the chat, in the chat. Now, listen, um, Tonight, the lecture, well, the, the speakers will go for about 45 minutes and we'll then have a chance for a Q&A with our speakers afterwards. So can I please ask that you all, if you have questions for our speakers throughout, um, can you put them in the Q&A? There's a little icon, there should be a little icon down the bottom of your screen, which is the Q&A feature. That's where you can post your questions. It's much easier for us uh, at the end of the session to, to manage questions through the Q&A. If you put them in the chat, you'll see people are chatting all the way through. We will not find your questions. 
So please try and use the Q and A function uh, to make sure that we can we can put those questions to the speakers. If we run out of time tonight um, with too many questions, I'm sure we can impress on our speakers to to answer some of those offline. Um, now, for those of you who join us uh, most sessions, you know that I yeah, uh, there's a few minutes of housekeeping here. For those um, who haven't yet run off and grabbed a refreshment, please feel free to, just while I uh, finalise the, the housekeeping. Um, one thing I always like to do in our Talking History Online is give a shout out to our fabulous History Trust support team behind the scenes, because they're, they're the people that let you in, they're the people that help you with your tech problems, they're the people that rejoin you if you lose your connection. Um, and they're fabulous. They're, they're such a good support. So tonight we have Catherine and Suzanne behind the scenes. So a big shout out to them. They're the ones that are going to help you if you run into any difficulties tonight. Also, just a reminder that these sessions are recorded and we do endeavour to get them up on our SoundCloud and YouTube channels within a couple of weeks, often much sooner. So if you don't already follow us on the History Trust of South Australia's social media or through signed up through our email account, uh, our email list, then please do so you get notification of when this, this recording is uh, live on our accounts. Uh, and don't worry, the, the Q&A function and the chat does not form part of the live recording that we put up on YouTube. So please feel free to discuss and, and chat away in the chat um, all you like. We export that just for the speakers. Okay, well, that's, that's about it in terms of formalities from me. So now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's topic and tonight's speakers. Um, the Adelaide Holocaust Museum and Andrew Steiner Education Centre uh, is Adelaide's newest museum and it opened back in November 2020. So we're actually coming up on 12 months. Wow, uh, that's quite a milestone. Um, the Holocaust Museum and Andrew Steiner Education Centre, I mean, it has an obligation to preserve Holocaust history and educate current and future generations through programs that instill human rights and develop ethical and social awareness of young people and the wider community. So no small undertaking. It's a really, really important museum and the work that it does is, is just amazing. Um, so tonight uh, we actually get to hear from the, the director, Kathy Bakich, director of the Holocaust Museum. And she'll provide some insight into the development of the museum and education center. And she'll highlight why the Holocaust matters still today. And, and what role Holocaust museums play in sharing that critical, those critical lessons that still need to be heard and remembered today. And then we'll hear from the curator, Pauline Cockrell, who will provide an overview of the curation process of the permanent exhibition. Um, and Pauline will reveal research being undertaken for a new exhibition on South Australian survivors of the Holocaust. Um, uncovering some unique South Australian stories and initiatives that have emerged in relation to those who sought refuge here, as well as the individuals and organisations who assisted them. And I hear that's a really rich story, what, what's come out since the Holocaust Museum, uh, well, in development and, and uh, since it's opened. So that's a really amazing thing and something, um, a, a huge legacy already. So um, I'm going to throw over to Kathy Bakich, who is the Centre Director of the Adelaide Holocaust Museum and Stein, Andrew Steiner Education Centre. Kathy is originally from Sydney. She's the second generation survivor or a child of a survivor. So she's got a deeply personal connection to this topic. And she is an experienced executive leader in the arts and cultural sector with extensive uh, experience locally and abroad. So without further ado, I will hand over to Cathy. Thank you, Cathy. Thanks, Christy. Um, so thank you um, for being here, everyone. And I, before I get underway, I would just like to acknowledge that um, I'm, we're streaming here, or we're zooming here from the actual permanent, part of the permanent exhibition here at the Adelaide Holocaust Museum and Andrew Steiner Education Centre, or AMSEC as we like to call it as its acronym. Um, and that, um, that we are, that our museum stands on um, Ghana land. Um, so I will just go about um, 
And I'm just going to give you a bit of a background of the actual museum and how it came into being. Um, but just I'm just going to get my screen up. Mm. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, the um, Holocaust Museum is located in Fennessy House, which is a building that's owned by the Catholic Archdiocese of Adelaide. Um, and this is rather, I guess, in terms of our museum, quite a unique um, partnership. Um, we're very grateful to the Archdiocese. Um, the museums are located on the lower ground, on, on the ground floor of um, Venice House. And we're right by um, the Cathedral, um, St. Saviour's um, Cathedral uh, and we're at 33 um, Wakefield Street. So some people, interestingly, the other week I was at a meeting and someone actually did say to me, oh, why is there a Holocaust Museum? Why do we need that here in Adelaide? But before we sort of get underway with that, I just want to share with you a little bit about what our vision is as a museum. So um, by telling the stories of the Holocaust, um, we educate and inspire South Australians to stand up against anti-Semitism and racism and actively contribute to a fairer, just and more compassionate world. Um, so for those of you who might not know, the Holocaust um, is actually a Greek word. It comes and it means sacrifice by fire. It was first used in the 1950s by English speakers to describe this event. Jewish people often use the term Shoah, which is the Hebrew word for catastrophe. Given the time that we have today, I just aim to provide you, as I've mentioned, with the context of AMSEC and the importance of examining the Holocaust and why it's important to continue to educate people about this history. So the Holocaust was the systematic state-sponsored persecution and murder of 6 million Jews by the Nazi regime, its allies and collaborators. The Holocaust was an unprecedented legal attempt by a government to murder all European Jewry and thus extinguish their culture, my culture, um, and it fundamentally challenged the foundations of human values. So uh, we've heard tonight that it is nearly a year since we opened our doors. We actually formally launched the museum on the 9th of November last year, which is the anniversary of Kristallnacht. So just to give you a bit of background, um, and a lot of people will know the information that I'm about to share, um, and looking at the events of the uh, Holocaust history, um, it's very hard to reduce that down into 20, 25 minutes and do justice to it. But between 1933 and 1945, the Nazis implemented the 2000 anti-Jewish decrees and laws. On the 15th of September in 1935, at a rally in Nuremberg, the Nazis announced two new laws. Uh, the first one being the Reich Citizenship Law and the law, the second one, the law of the protection of German blood and German honour. These have become known today as the Nuremberg Laws and um, they were announced in the city of Nuremberg. The laws were enacted because the Nazis wanted to put their ideas about race into law. They believed uh, the false theory that the world is divided into distinct races that are not equally strong and valuable. They saw Germans as supposedly superior, as a superior Aryan race, and it was the strongest and most valuable race of all. Jews, on the other hand, were not Aryan, and the Nazis thought Jews belonged to a separate race that was inferior to all races, dividing people into us and them, 
all classification as has been identified in Stanton's 10 stages of the genocide process. The Nazi regime also targeted other groups because of their perceived racial and um, biological inferiority. These include the Roma, people with disabilities, Slavic people and other groups were persecuted on political or ideological grounds or difference. These included communists, homosexuals, socialists, trade unionists and Jehovah Witnesses. So the conditions that led to the Holocaust um, are unique in time and place, but nonetheless, it was a human event and it raises challenging questions about individual and collective responsibility, the meaning of positive citizenship and about the structure of societal norms that um, can become dangerous for certain groups and societies as a whole. So just a little bit about the background of our museum. So you'll notice that we have an education centre which is named after Andrew Steiner. Andrew Steiner uh, migrated here to Adelaide from Hungary, Budapest. And Andrew uh, grew up in hiding in Budapest. And he has for the past 30, 31 years now been sharing his story of survival and his experience of bearing witness to the events of the Holocaust to schools throughout Adelaide. Um, this also two other survivors have done this as well. Uh, one of our survivors who's featured here in our museum, Fred Steiner, is actually the survivor that uh, handed over the baton in terms of doing work in schools to Andrew. And last week, we also too commemorated the um, anniversary of the uprising of Sobibor at the Sobibor camp. And we were fortunate enough here to have Regina Zelinsky, um, who lived in Adelaide for some time, and who was also to lived in Sydney as well previously. Um, so um, it's been Andrew's vision to have a museum established to ensure that we can continue to educate people about the Holocaust. And a very, um, so Andrew and his late wife, uh, Helen Tversky Steiner, established the Remember the Holocaust Compassion for All Foundation, which provided the starting point for our museum and gave the, um, the foundation the capacity to raise funds in order to um, fit out and um, the museum space and to undertake uh, the aspects of design and the curation as well of our permanent exhibition. And there was a whole team that sat behind that. So as you'll hear from Pauline, our curator, but I would actually at this time just like to acknowledge um, our, our project design team, um, Iguana Creative, as well as um, the project management team um, led by uh, Sue Drentz as well as other um, people that contributed towards the development of the curation process, including um, Karen Langman. Um, and there were a number of other people that we had as consultants, people from Adelaide University, um, Vesna Drapak and Gareth Pritchard, as well as um, Avril Alba from um, Sydney University, from the School of Bis Biblical and Jewish Studies as well. Um, so we are really grateful um, to all of the people that contributed to the final um, curatorial and design process um, of what we have here today. Um, so increasingly museums play an integral role in preserving, as has already been mentioned, Holocaust history. As we move towards a world and a post-survivor world where there will no longer be witnesses who uh, saw these events and atrocities unfold. Uh, the history and remembrance of bearing witness and education must move forward with second and third generation um, descendants. So you can see here in this beautiful picture, we have Hannah Webster, who is the daughter um, of Andrew Steiner and um, 
his youngest grandchild and Hannah's son Jude. Um, so this is a real, I guess, a reflection of how we will continue to be able to share these stories about the Holocaust. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, we did open on the 9th of November, a significant event. It coincided with the anniversary of Kristallnacht or the night of broken glass. Uh, this took place on the evening of uh, the 9th and 10th of November in 1938. So a time in the Nazis in Germany, Austria and the Sudetenland torched synagogues, vandalised Jewish homes, schools and businesses and killed close to 100 people. Following the event, 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. For most Jews, it represented the turning point and a vision of what was to come. People did live through the Holocaust and survived. And many have migrated to countries such as Australia, the United States, South America. Some returned to Europe, some chose to um, move to um, Israel. So there's a whole mass of migration that happens. Um, and Let's now just take a few moments and what before we share a video of what some of our survivors and you'll have a taste of what our exhibition looks like in this video. But I do want to share the story of these um, three survivors. So two are featured in our, um, in our museum here, Andrew Steiner and Eva Temple. And we also too recently through the work that Pauline has been doing and being kept informed by other community members, found out about another survivor here in Adelaide, Leo Cohen, who was uh, in Bergen-Belsen. And um, we only recently had the opportunity to share and take his testimony about what happened. So I will just leave it to hand over. <sighs> is that about 50 percent around the world have no idea about the Holocaust at all. A lot of people think still that the Holocaust was actually a, a story only but I can assure you it was not and it was truth. I think it's important that people are aware of what has happened in the past in the hope, and I do hope, that, that they learn from it. I'm a Holocaust survivor who decided to bear witness and uh, I have been educating about the Holocaust. October 16th, 1944, we were lined up, hands raised, and waiting to be executed. Across the road, another Jewish star house, in our household. 14 people murdered on the spot. My name is Leo Cohen, and um, I'm originally from Holland. Now, I was originally um, picked up in 1943 by the Germans. Somebody put me in. Um, and I was first in jail 
and later on in a Dutch concentration camp called Westerbork and afterwards in Bergen-Belsen. I was too young to know what was in the camp and I was taken with my grandmother to Bergen-Belsen, they believe in about the October. Um, I was found in my grandmother's dying arms on liberation when they were going through the huts. My, my grandmother died actually on the 5th of May afterwards. We were segregated, we were yellow stars, we only could go out uh, during restricted times of the day and so we, we were already outside the society. In the end there were so many people dead died in the camp that you had to step over the over the dead bodies and I have to say that some people even were so hungry that that they took some meat from the dead bodies to eat. That's honestly, that happened. I saw it with my own eyes. I don't know how my grandmother kept me alive because there was very limited food. Um, and a lot, there was a lot of sickness as well. That dysentery, diarrhea and um, a typhoid and all sorts of things like that. There are very few of us left now, so hence the importance and the urgency is greater. Uh, it, it is valuable for people to know what happened during the war, because wars are terrible and things what happened, especially during the last war, it was so terrible and cost so many people their lives, innocent people, uh, that uh, it is better for people to actually understand what, 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 what really occurred. Hatred and fighting and is not the answer to the world at this moment, but it seems to be the only thing that people seem to know. I feel it's important that they learn the history of it and that they have a better understanding of what has happened and hopefully can teach them, um, the children can learn from it that, this, that we need to get a better world. The act of remembrance really belongs to us all. Whoever will visit the museum will gain an insight of man's dual capabilities. This, in fact, will be a beacon of light of the possibility within interfaith collaboration. sharing of those um, of our incredible survivors in that video there something that really strikes me about the importance of why our museum exists and why we are committed to educating young people and the wider community about the events of the holocaust is really highlighted by this following quote from Primo Levi. Um, some of you may be familiar um, with his work. He's a survivor from Auschwitz and he wrote two autobiographical um, novels, If This Is a Man and the Truce. 
And really, I think the words for me resonate from our survivors. Things like discrimination, fear, anti-Semitism, hatred, racism are learnt. And I personally don't want to see our world come into a time again where we cannot make sense of the world. And for me, this quote really encapsulates um, an experience of what happened to Primo Levi when he was at um, Auschwitz, reaching out for an icicle um, from his barrack window. He's thirsty, he tries to grab it, he, he needs some water, um, and a Nazi guard just smashes it out of his hand. And Primo Levi is there saying like, Varum, why, why? And the soldier returns, here is kind Varum. Here, there is no why. And that's why as a museum, we are really committed to ensuring that our education programs educate people about the events that happened to ensure that events like this do not happen into the future as we move forward. Um, so the 27th um, and the 27th of January in 2022 will actually mark the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which is known as the UN International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And as memories fade about these historic events, um, there's an increased sense of urgency to educate people about the atrocities of the Holocaust and the horrors of World War II. Um, when e examining the Holocaust, we're engaging with complicated moral questions, um, many of which do not come with simple answers. Um, education about the Shoah, the Holocaust, encourages us to reflect on how individuals could or should act in society. Um, many scholars and governments today are extremely aware of the need to educate society about the dangers of exclusionary institutionalized structures and uh, genocidal social policies, which really does highlight the important role that we have to play as in a museum. Um, and in recent times, we have seen the rise of far right groups, such as the National Socialist Network here in Australia, um, as well as um, conspiracy theorists using anti-Semitic tropes via a range of social media platforms. Um, when the White House was stormed with QAnon, the people in the White House wearing T-shirts with six million weren't enough. So it's something that does need to be addressed um, and continue to be addressed. Um, it's also to a cause for concern that there are far right candidates um, getting votes and being taken seriously. And whilst the conditions that we live in today aren't the same, there are um, a lot of similarities, political unrest, inequalities, lack of employment um, opportunities and fragmented societies. And these are all very similar conditions that help the Nazis get into power. For me, what is important about Holocaust education is that it encourages students to um, gain a better understanding of human rights and awareness of genocide and through that awareness, promoting social justice. Um, it supports the effective examination of basic moral issues, provides reflections on the dangers of remaining silent, apathetic and indifferent to the oppression of others. It helps learners to identify danger signals and to know when to take constructive actions. 
ed Holocaust education programs support students in understanding the roots and ramifications of prejudice, racism and stereotyping in society, provides the understanding about the responsibility of citizens in any society. And it gives learners the opportunity to develop an awareness of the value of diversity and getting to know other people, um, getting finding out about other people, other cultures. And in effect, for me, it's about connecting with diversity and in effect for us as a society to celebrate that diversity rather than looking at the differences that divide us is by looking for what we all share in common, which is we all share a common humanity. Um, and that's, I guess, where, you know, it really helps, I guess, in a sense, for, to develop that expanded view of humanity in our world today. And as was said at the introduction, um, the museum has an obligation to preserve uh, Holocaust history for future generations to learn from, to educate and develop the moral and social awareness. Um, and young people today are our future leaders. And it's imperative that we ensure the atrocities of the Holocaust are not repeated especially given the diminishing number of survivors able to be able to share their testimony and to tell their stories directly. Um, and um, it's um, important to expose young people to these historical events um, and to you know, help in times in difficult times like we've been experiencing, uh, we've all felt the impact of around the world of, of events. And, um, you know, it helps them to um, gain an understanding of others and um, promote compassion and tolerance. Um, and because otherwise, um, how else can we understand the potential dire consequences of exclusion, division, and the lack of compassion towards others? Since March 2021, AMSEC on average has welcomed 40 school students per day um, as part of our education program, which runs across three days um, per week, Tuesdays through to Thursdays. Um, and as we move forward, um, we're planning to uh, develop and embark on another capital development program, which will see us um, take the museum into onto the next level, onto level one here at Fantasy House. Um, and through this, we will develop a more interactive education space um, for students, and also to um, a space where we can hold uh, wider public um, events and programs um, and feature different um, activities such as film screenings um, that are connected and related in some way to either people in our community here or our, through our survivor community here or documentary screenings, um, an array of different activity, and also to some workshops um, inspired by what some of the um, incredible survivors have gone on to do um, in their lives, making their lives here in South Australia and in Adelaide. Um, and I just think it's probably now uh, the poignant time for me to hand over um, to let you hear from Pauline, to give you an insight, you've just seen some of the inside footage of our museum, but to give you an insight into um, the curatorial um, process and uh, the design, and also to, to tell you about some of the um, incredible and fascinating stories that have been uncovered uh, here in the last 18 months.
Okay, thank you so much, Cathy, for that. And um, I really want to say um, hello to everyone and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about um, Adelaide's newest museum. I'm so excited about um, being the curator there. It's just um, something I'm really passionate about. I I'm not Jewish, but um, I'm just passionate about museums being um, change, make agents of change and um, doing something about social justice. What I'd like to share now is um, talk about briefly the permanent exhibition, why it is what it is, and then also more specifically about how this um, museum um, is, is different from others um, uh, because of the South Australian stories. Now, Kathy's already um, shown you um, the fact that we're in Fantasy House, and this is maybe a, a better picture to show you where we're right in the centre of Adelaide, we're right next door to St Francis Xavier Cathedral. And as Cathy said, we've, we're just developing our exhibition, or we have developed our exhibition and education centre on the first floor of, of Fennessy House, you see there in the centre. Um, but let me quickly show you um, what I was faced with when I joined the curation team in September 2019, about 18 months ago. Um, the, so Fennessy House is, was, is owned by the Catholic Church and it was used by the um, community uh, Centre Care Catholic Family Services and it was basically um, a big office space and um, offices um, and this is actually the exhibition you saw the video, um, Cathy showed you the video, the walkthrough of the exhibition, it's hard to believe that this is what um, the exhibition space looked like um, about a year before it was launched. And I do, as Cathy said, want to acknowledge um, also the um, fantastic curation team that um, I joined um, about 18 months ago. Um, there was a huge amount of work had already been done when I, when I joined um, with the project manager, Sue Drent, and the education uh, had been researched by Karen Langman. Um, th th already the, um, the plan that... that the plan of the, the gallery had already been um, designed. Um, a lot of the texts had already been written. The basic texts had been written. A lot of the photographs and the um, moving images had been researched. Um, basically, I was brought in to um, make it sing, bring it all together, massage the content, make final selection of photographs um, and of moving images and really get it on the wall and get it to do what it was intended to do. Um, obviously, this was a huge challenge um, because, as you can understand, the Holocaust is a huge, complex subject that requires sensitive treatment. The Holocaust conjures up images of brutality so profound that it is hard for the mind to comprehend. So what stories do we tell? How can we engage without trauma and yet not sanitize or dumb down? Plus, of course, there's all those those um, those other restraints um, that we have to live with, with the time frame and a certain budget. And on top of that, of course, there was COVID. So it was a really, really complex challenge, but something I was up for. But sometimes it seemed like it was just so overwhelming. Um, it, as I say, it was a big, a big, big topic. But gradually, like the walls of the gallery, of the exhibition space, it began to take shape and um, we began to see where we were going. Now, Cathy showed you a quick run through of a video of the, of the exhibition. That's interesting to see that because it was actually before it was completely finished. So there were lots of things missing, I could see anyway. Um, but I want to give you a sort of a brief idea of um, how we decided to um, curate the exhibition. Um, what, was it, what was our thinking behind it? As I said, they'd already decided that um, there were going to be 10 themes of the exhibition as the backdrop, as the framework. These were the historical facts that really sort of traced the history of the Holocaust. And um, each theme had a question um, which encouraged uh, critical thinking. We wanted to really make this engaging for um, high school students. This was our principal audience, so also for the general public as well. So um, we began by looking at um, the Jewish world that was, um, we went through the rise of Nazism um, and then um, came to the look at um, history's oldest hatred and really understand what anti-Semitism was and why the Jews. Uh, we looked at how the introduction of the Nuremberg laws changed life for Jewish people uh, living under the Nazi regime, culminating in Kristallnacht. 
um, the Night of Broken Glass, which was a state sanctioned pogrom of November 1938. And then we start looking at the escalation of Jewish people fleeing Europe if they can or if they have to go into hiding. Then with total war, we move into the final solution or what was considered the final solution by the Nazi regime, which was the full scale industrial murder of the Jewish people, uh, um, as well as those who um, were considered opposition to the Nazi regime. And from this major climax, um, we move out into a more reflective mood and we look at liberation and what it meant to Holocaust survivors to make a new life and consider the different kinds of people who make up the narrative, the perpetrators, the bystanders, the rescuers. And finally, something to think on, we reveal the invention of the word genocide. And despite Holocaust survivors coining the phrase, never again, we acknowledge that genocide has happened again and again and again in recent years. We think of Rwanda, Cambodia, Bosnia, Myanmar. And we finish with the importance of Holocaust education and why we feel this museum is important for future generations. So how we tell this story, um, we can see here we've chosen really large images like wallpaper size that we can really um, look into people's eyes and um, really engage with them. Um, they're really arresting still paper, wallpaper images. And we've also chosen um, loop short audio visual presentations as well. And um, also chosen some key iconic objects. The sort of things you expect to see in a Holocaust museum. Now, when we started, we had absolutely no objects at all in our collection. And um, one of my jobs was to go and find those objects to fit in the museum. And um, we, we thanks, thankfully to the Sydney Jewish Museum, we had some really fantastic loans of some really key iconic objects. As you can see here, that we've got the Torah scroll, which um, is the most holiest and most important objects in object in Ju Judaism, which we felt was um, really important to um, start off the exhibition to really um, anchor um, what, what Jewish life was, the principles of Jewish life and Jewish religious life was about. And this particular memorial, this particular scroll is a memorial scroll from London, from the Memorial Scrolls Trust. Um, and it was rescued, it's a really significant object because it was rescued from a synagogue in a small town in former Czechoslovakia during the uh, Nazi occupation of what was then Bohemia and Moravia. And it's a moving reminder of the vanished Jewish communities of this area of Central Europe. And we also borrowed um, two other very key objects, the Yellow Star of David badge and um, part of a striped concentration camp uniform from the, um, both from the Sydney Jewish Museum, um, very poignant objects. So it's a very small area and we, we can't have cluttered up objects. Um, we just wanted really um, very significant ones that could have the stories. And when I say we had no objects in our collection, that's not absolutely true because we were so fortunate that just as we were developing the exhibition, we were offered this amazing collection, which I describe as a curator's dream collection from a local person, a local GP, Pam Rashutin, who was originally from the US, uh, whose mother, Annie, was a Holocaust survivor. And this is just a fantastic collection because it's like a, a microcosm of what it was like growing up Jewish in Germany in the 1930s. Now, Annie had been very fortunate to escape Nazi persecution and emigrate to America um, when she was uh, almost 12 years old. She came from Germany. She came with her, her family, her parents, to join her 15-year-old brother who had emigrated on his own uh, the year before uh, to join family. So they were the lucky ones. And um, they took with them a lot of family heirlooms, photographs, documents, and other ephemera. Uh, as, and then when Annie um, grew up in, in America, she started writing her memoirs of, of her experiences of the Holocaust. And in later years, used to, to do talks uh, to schools and other groups about her experiences. So we were really fortunate to have, as I say, a curator's dream. You've not only got the objects, but you've got the photographs that go with the objects and the stories written by the person, just fantastic. And the one thing that, um, that is often remarked by our volunteers and about um, um, the people who visit um, the museum is this fantastic dress which has a wonderful story uh, to tell. It's a very simple object and so often museum objects are just simple, may seem very ordinary but often have very powerful stories that really resonate. And this story is the story of Annie's resistance to the Nazi regime. This was her best dress that she wore when she was nine years old a very traditional dirndl dress with an apron that her mother, Bertha, made. She made all her clothes and did lots of fantastic German craft work. 
And Annie wore this best dress on this particular day when her uncle, who's pictured here, um, was visiting from Poland. They, her mother had made this wonderful meal for them. And they decided they wanted ice cream and they went out. Um, she was wearing her, her dress and they decided to go out and buy ice cream from the ice cream shop down the road. But it was 1935 when the Nuremberg laws had just come in. And many of these laws had banned, um, included shops banning Jewish customers. And this was such a shop, it had a sign which said, no Jews allowed. And Annie was rather scared. Um, she said, we can't go in. She said to her uncle, we can't go in. We, you know, obviously we're Jewish. But he said, um, no, we are going in. Don't worry, we're going in. She was terrified that they would be discovered, but they went in trepidation, bought their ice cream, no one asked any questions and they left. And from that point on, Annie thought her uncle was her knight in shining armor, and it was the day that she resisted the Nazi regime, so it has a very, very important story. And all these objects and documents and photographs have similar stories and tell the story of um, what it was to say, what it was like growing up Jewish and escaping the, the Nazi regime in Europe. So, um, and this and these this collection was um, it was always Annie's Annie's wish that this this collection would would be um, used to tell continue her her legacy of telling the story of the Holocaust to to future generations, and we're very happy that um, this collection has been donated to us, and that Annie knew before she died um, that this collection was being used um, in Adelaide to to tell those stories, and it was very sad that uh, she she held on, but she did die unfortunately um, in America at the beginning of this year. And unfortunately, quite tragically, um, although she survived the Holocaust, it was COVID that took her in the end. So, um, so through objects, we tell we tell the story of the Holocaust. We we tell um, the historical facts of the Holocaust. But I think it's also important in Holocaust education that we learn about the Holocaust through the voices of those survivors. And um, we've we've obviously through Annie's story, we can we hear her voice through those. But we have um, six particular uh, survivors that are very important to us who were selected at the beginning of the curation progress. They all have Adelaide and South Australian stories. They all um, emigrated after the Holocaust to, to Adelaide and made South Australia their home, either for the whole of the rest of their life or part of their life. They all have um, very different experience of the Holocaust. They come from different countries. As we said, Andrew comes from Hungary. He survived um, the Holocaust through, through being in hiding. There's those that were in Germany, Fred Steiner who survived Auschwitz. Um, there was Gary who um, survived by being sent with the kinder transport to the UK. Um, we've talked about Eva and Regina. Regina from Poland survived Sobibor, Eva of Bergen-Belsen, and uh, John, who came from Germany, and he always thought that uh, his story wasn't important because he said, I just ran away, but he still had to um, get through um, running, uh, get through going through Europe from, um, from Germany to, to Holland and then down through France and uh, finally to safety in Switzerland, um, always running the possibility of being deported. So although he thought he ran away, he, he was really, really brave. Um, and all these um, these six six survivors, they're all they're all young. They're all um, apart from Eva, who was a baby. They were all teenagers during the Holocaust, during the war years. So we feel um, not only have they got South Australian stories, but they're also young and can um, we hopefully engage with young um, high high school students and they can. And we've we've if we had had more money, it would have been great to have had done this digitally, where we could have had people we could ha have heard people's stories. Um, by audio, we could have shown more photographs, but we didn't have the money. So we've just shown it the analog way, the simple way we've had their, their photos and we've had quotes that they, their actual quotes that they've said about their experiences of the Holocaust that um, are get, uh, 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 put throughout the exhibition under the different themes. So you can follow, if you don't want to read all the historical facts, you can follow the story of the Holocaust through their eyes, through their voices. So apart from um, those that that sort of um, Holocaust trail, we also want to tell um, scattered throughout the exhibition. There are other stories about that have South Australian connections, and they're both inspirational stories and they're also uncomfortable stories. And it's very important um, in museums not not just tell the, the happy nostalgic stories, but also tell the, the the difficult stories as well. It's important to be authentic 
and tell the truth. And there are um, some uncomfortable stories that come from South Australia. Um, and there's a, a couple here I'll show here. Um, we all know that South Australia has a long history of German migrants making new lives here. And one of those was Johannes Heinrich Becker, who migrated to Tulunda in the Barossa Valley from Germany in 1927. And he joined Hitler's Nazi party um, and was appointed state trustee for Australia and later state leader for Australia in the South Pacific. And we tell his story briefly in the, just to sort of counter, counter the, what was going on um, in the world and in, in South Australia. He was being described as Australia's number one Nazi and he lived in South Australia. Although from 1936, he did not play an official role in the party. And we also know that uh, there were other Hitler supporters within Adelaide and South Australia. And this is an amazing story, uh, amazing photograph here of the German club in Adelaide. Uh, decorated for Hitler's 50th birthday on the 20th of April 1939 by local, uh, by local Nazi sympathiser. And it's also um, interesting, and maybe people don't know this, that there were only three cases brought against um, suspected Nazi war criminals in Australia, and they were all South Australian residents. Only one ended in trial, and the only Holocaust war tri crimes trial in Australia happened here in Adelaide. In 1993, alleged Nazi war criminal Ivan Polyakovich was tried and, but acquitted after a nine-week ordeal in the Adelaide Supreme Court. So we do um, tell those stories. Um, but um, we prefer to also really tell them the more inspirational stories. Um, and apart from scattering the South Australian stories, I wanted to really concentrate on having a section that really concentrate on these South Australian stories. So in the, in the theme, which says, how did Australians respond? Um, we added, how did South Australians respond? And this was specifically about um, how um, the Jewish, Jewish refugees who fleed the Nazi regime in the late 30s, particularly after Kristallnacht, um, came to Australia and to, and to South Australia and, and um, made South Australia their home. Um, in particular, um, we know that from 1933 to 39, Australia took between seven to 8,000 Jewish refugees from, from Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia, um, escaping the um, Nazi regime. And over 5,000 arrived in 1939 alone. And we know that the majority went to Melbourne and Sydney. However, by the time the war had begun, around um, 150 German and Austrian and um, a few Czechoslovakian refugees had settled in South Australia, increasing the state's dwindling Jewish community by a third. And many individuals and organizations sought to help them settle into the community, uh, none more so than the, the rabbi at the time who arrived from London in 1936, that's um, Louis Rubin Sachs, who um, he was appointed rabbi of the Adelaide Hebrew Congregation in 1936, and he was keenly interested in social work and education, and he started the Adelaide branch of the Jewish Welfare Society. Um, so he played a great part um, in, in helping the Jewish refugees settle in. Um, introduction with many other organizations. Um, one of these was the Adelaide Women Graduate, Adelaide University Women Graduates Association. Um, who we know at least helped at least sponsor two women graduates um, from Germany and Austria. And also the Lutheran Church as well played a great part and other churches. Now initial research made some really interesting discoveries and I only had a very short window um, to do this research at the beginning of 2020 uh, because of COVID, unfortunately. Um, it was a really a race against time to get the research in before libraries closed and um, the access to information was was growing very very difficult, and I really want to um, pay um, acknowledge um, people like Peter Montit um, from Flinders University, who had done a lot of this um, research before, and written a lot of papers and um, on the subject, and I used a lot of his uh, his research. So I really want to acknowledge him um, for the work that we did for this particular section. Um, so. I guess in, in the main um, that I uncovered, there were two sorts of uh, people that were coming in 1939 period, just before the war. Um, 
and just like the beginning of the war when borders finally closed at the, uh, to the early 1940s. In particular, there were a lot of professionals that were coming from Germany and Austria. Um, this is when um, the, the, the Jewish, Jewish um, professionals were losing their jobs because of the Nuremberg laws. Um, they were just no longer be able to practice as doctors, lawyers, um, university academics, um, teachers. They literally lost their jobs. One day they were working, the next day they, they'd lost their jobs and were seeking somewhere else to live. And many ended up in Adelaide. Um, in particular, um, it's an interesting story about the doctors who arrived in Adelaide. There was a, a handful that came here in the early um, part of the, um, the, the late thirties and early part of, of the war years. And what was interesting was the fact that um, Adelaide University had a particular special course that they developed for migrant migrant doctors, um, because normally they would not be able to register here in, in Australia um, because of their, their foreign qualifications. Um, and so they would have to retake their degree at the university in, in Australia. And normally this would take six years, which is a hell of a long time to have to um, to wait to be able to practice your, your profession who, when you're really a, quite a, an expert in the subject. Um, but Adelaide um, University in particular changed this um, and made a, a short three year course that they could do that. So we had a number of doctors that came here because of that. Um, and we were lucky to get um, some objects from Migration Museum and able to tell the story of, in particular, Ernest Flaum or Ernst Flaum, originally from Vienna. Um, and we have his, he'd actually arrived here because of his wife, Ella, who was, who was, uh, had got a job. She was a scientist who had also lost a job in Vienna. She was a scientist and got a job at the CSIRO in Adelaide. He came and was unable to work as a doctor. So he worked for the university for a while while he, um, got into the university course and finally um, graduated. He was the first to graduate, first of the foreign doctors to graduate from the University of Adelaide and finally practiced. Um, we see a photograph here of um, himself and his wife and his daughter, Barbara, who was born here in Adelaide. And we thank Barbara for the, for the um, information that she, she gave us. And you also see on display the actual textbook that he wrote he was a expert in um in cardiology um back in in austria and it was uh, ironic that when he was having to do his degree again at the at the university in adelaide here he actually had to use his own textbook while um while in training which was he thought that was quite funny so we have a copy of that book and the ernst urban also was another um um german um family uh, doctor who came here and retrained here, um, in Adelaide. But um, his story, it's more his wife's story that's interesting. His wife, Regina, was a dentist from um, a Polish Jew, um, Jewish family. And they, when they arrived, they were hoping to bring her family over as well um, from Poland. And because um, they could not bring much with them, they were not allowed to bring money or um, expensive items. Um, the Polish fam the, her family sent over one by one pieces of cutlery um, ready for when they arrived. So it says we have the pieces of cutlery here on display on, on loan from the Migration Museum, which is very poignant. It might just look like a piece of, piece of silver, a piece of cutlery, which you'd have. Um, but the poignant story is the fact that they had to send it over piece by piece because they weren't allowed to bring it over. And unfortunately, time ran out and uh, her parents um, were deported and never got here and were and perished in the Holocaust. So that's a very sad reminder of, um, of, of what happened to their family. Um, there were also many teachers that um, ended up here um, teaching in our schools in Adelaide, many of the, the private schools in Adelaide. And um, I've got pictured here, Dr. Robert Ellis, he originally was from Germany. His original name was Elsasser, so many of the, um, Jewish refugees did change their name. It's just so much easier to pronounce, and also they wanted to not be recognised as as, um, as as Jewish. Um, and he arrived. He actually arrived in in the nineteen thirty nine or thirty eight thirty nine um, in Sydney originally um, with his wife and two little girls, uh, Charlotte and Gretel. Um, and they um, spent time in, in New South Wales and then arrived in 1945 here in Adelaide. He got he'd lost his job in Germany as a teacher because of being Jewish. 
um, um, and he got a job at um, Prince Alfred College, which is, um, for those not in Adelaide, is a, a private school, private boys school here in Adelaide. Uh, he is a teacher of German, um, much well loved um, there, and also played chess, I believe, was very important in the chess club. Uh, his wife also um, I was Swiss and taught French, I believe, in another school at some point, um, or at the university, I believe. And his two daughters who only arrived, um, when they arrived, they couldn't speak English, they only spoke German and French, but they, they, um, they learned it pretty quickly. When they came to Adelaide, they went to Walford School, um, a well-known um, girls' private school here. And um, Gretel um, then went to Adelaide University, where she met her husband-to-be, who was Don Dunstan, um, who, um, to those in South Australia, very well-known premier in the 1970s. So um, we've got some just examples of um, Jewish refugees who really made um, important um, contribution to the, to the community here in, in South Australia. Now, I talked about the professionals who, um, who came here, the Jewish refugee professionals, but there was also another group um, that is particular to South Australia who arrived um, in 39. There were 16 um, young um, teenagers aged about 15, 16, 17, 18, the oldest I think was in their 20s, from Germany and Poland. They arrived um, to become um, agricultural apprentices at Kaipo for those not um, not uh, from South Australia. Kaipo is in the Adelaide Hills um, near the town of Meadows. Um, in the 1930s, it was being used by the Methodist um, minister, the head of the, the superintendent of the Methodist church had developed um, a colony there called the Kaipo Industrial Colony, which sounds a very strange name, but it was actually basically a, a farm to um, help those in the 30s from the depression, um, from the down and outs to, um, get new skills as agricultural apprentices. So come um, 39, when um, the plight of Jewish refugees was in the news, um, the Methodist uh, superintendent sort of collaborated with the Jewish rabbi here and decided that they could um, take on some Jewish refugees to also become, um, learn farming skills out at Kaipo. So um, in, in total, there were 16 that came from Germany and um, Poland. And um, I was lucky to find um, through the internet, wonders of the internet, the granddaughter of one of these um, Jewish refugees. Um, this is Harry, Harry Peters, who uh, originally was Herman Polnow. He had his name changed when he arrived in Melbourne at the age of 18 um, to the name of, they were mainly given um, English, very English sounding names to make it easier for them, they said. So he became Harry Peters. Uh, his father was, um, a very important or a well-known, well-renowned um, uh, surgeon um, in, in Berlin. Um, and he left his parents behind in Berlin, um, never to see them again. They, um, they did perish in, in the Holocaust. So he arrived, um, he'd, he'd done some training already at another um, farm in Germany and he arrived with others. Um, they, they sort of came in groups um, to Kaipo, um, ended up, came to Adelaide were, and then, came to Adelaide from Melbourne and then um, were driven out to Kaipo and spent several months um, in Kaipo um, in, the, in the farm, learning how to milk cows, um, chop down trees, um, basic farming skills. Um, he um, have some, have some photos of him and also the photos of the um, railway carriages that they had to to sleep in. Um, we know it was really, really, they arrived in June, July in, um, in the Adelaide Hills. We know um, for those who live in the Adelaide Hills, it'd be very cold and wet at that time. And he apparently remembers it being so cold and wet, he used to sleep in his raincoat. So um, he, he, he and many of the others, they, they stayed there for a few months, learned their farming skills, and most of them went and um, moved elsewhere eventually, but they did call South Australia home for a short period. And he um, went and retrained or trained eventually as a doctor in Sydney. And, um, and he too also um, knew that his story was being told. He lived um, to the early, um, early part of this year, but didn't know his story was being told. So we're really, really good. That was really, really thankful for that. So um, quickly, the, the, we have a survivors gallery. Um, I've talked about the six survivors that we um, that we have the survivors trail through the main exhibition. 
Um, and we have a survivor's gallery that tells these stories, these six survivors in, in, um, in more detail. Um, and we want to develop this survivor's gallery. And we started some research, as I said, I had started the research for the main permanent exhibition. Um, but as um, research sort of gathered, um, and developed, we more and more names were coming coming to pass. We, as Kathy mentioned, we discovered Leo Cohen, who was um, an actual Holocaust survivor who'd been through Bergen-Belsen, Westerbork in in Holland, at Bergen-Belsen in Germany, and survived. And um, gradually, I was gathering a database of. Uh, so many different um, survivors, and when we talk about survivors, not those, that, not just those that had been through the concentration camps, but those had, who had been um, refugees who had escaped before the war, who had come here, um, and we know that they had uh, family members who had, did not survive. So we count those as survivors as well. How we have done this research, um, we have, um, as I say, from. Uh, doing research from desktop research, from um, looking in the library through Ancestry, through Trove, and from people telling us about um, um, who have visited, come through the museum, who have um, seen us on Facebook um, from our volunteers. Um, and we've also had, um, so we also had a session in the History Festival um, earlier this 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 year when um, I was I was there on every 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 um, uh, day a week and people could come and bring the, bring their stories and information that they had about um, anything about who any Jewish um, refugees or anyone who had um, escaped the Holocaust from Europe and who had made South Australia home. That database has just amazingly grown from strength to strength um, from. Um, it started off, um, we say, of the handful now, 100 at the beginning of the year, and now 200. We've got many professional people, doctors, dentists, scientists. We've got two vets, lots of teachers. We've got dressmakers, butchers, even a prawn fisherman in Port Lincoln. Um, it is growing. And I just want to end with this picture. There is, uh, you may, may not know this if you're not from Adelaide, but for everyone who's in Adelaide, um, this is a very iconic um object, it's the spheres, which we know as the Moors balls here in Adelaide. And it was actually made and created by a sculptor who was a Jewish refugee by Bert Flugelman. He arrived um, in Sydney in 1938 with his, um, as, as a refugee from Vienna, age 15, and eventually came here in the 70s and created for the town council this amazing sculpture. So I think I'll end here. Um, and it's, all I can say is that please, um, if you haven't been to if you haven't been to the museum, if you can, please do visit. If you have any stories um, that you'd like to share, please get in contact. And I await to hear your questions as well. Thank you. Uh, look, fabulous. Thank you, Pauline. And thank you, Cathy, for a really, really insightful um, examination of the origins of, of ARMSEC and, and just the amazing amount of work and efforts that has gone into opening that really important museum. Uh, right from Andrew's original vision to those incredible survivor stories and, and Pauline, obviously, I share your love of research. So hearing about the research you've done and the stories you've uncovered and, and I think you've both demonstrated so clearly the, the ongoing relevance of such museums and, and kind of that th those connections with South Australia. I mean, this impacted worldwide. And, and um, I think as Cathy, as you said, as we move into that post-survival world, just the importance of remembering and, and educating, um, educating people and especially our youth. Um, so thank you both very much. Now we've got some questions. I'm going to attempt to read them and synthesize things. Um, and listen, for anyone who needs to leave us, I'm aware some people need to jump off. It's dinner time in some places. Other places it's the middle of the night. Um, but if you're needing to leave us now, just remember this is being recorded. So you can tune back in at a later date and catch up on question time. Um, so. The first question uh, is, 
because uh, I think you, you've both mentioned just, you know, the importance of remembering this and, and the, the ongoing genocides and, and our need to be vigilant as we see the rise of far right groups and, and other things in society today. So Lynn asked, do, do you ever experience a sense of hopelessness in trying to educate people, um, particularly given some of the post-1945 examples that we see play out, having played out or playing out? Um, yeah, do you feel it's having an impact? I mean, obviously it's such important work, but yeah. Um, I feel speaking from the education program point of view, um, seeing some of the incredible feedback that students um, provide us with and the actual impact that it has um, on them has been really inspiring. And um, I think it's also, um, for me personally, what helps me is um, just knowing that really that I'm surrounded by the stories of these incredible um, people uh, who lived through these events and um, who have just gone on to, um, in, in effect, be committed to ensuring by sharing their stories that this doesn't happen again and um, yeah, I think that that's the mm -hmm. thing that keeps the positivity. Um, and we're not immune from um, people's views or, or comments, but um, um, if we don't talk about it, we'll forget it. Yeah. Yeah, I can say it, it, it was certainly um, really hard, actually, well, interesting doing the, all the research and, and developing the exhibition like last year under COVID and under, you know, Trump and all that, which seemed so similar to what was going on. Um, but I, and it sort of seemed like hopeless, hopeless in some ways that it was all happening again. But on the other hand, as I say, as Cathy says, the stories surrounding us are just so inspirational. That's what kind of keeps going yeah great thank you um we we have another question um so we're, we've got a number of questions here my, my fear is we won't get through all of them so i'm hoping both of our presenters will undertake to answer some of these offline uh we've got a lot of comments through about how insightful this presentation was and uh, the questions will be really interesting. So if we don't get through them all, we will email them out to so the, the speaker's answers out to everyone, for those of you who may need to leave. Um, so there's another question here about um, when you've been looking into to those stories or testimonies of um, survivors and, and who, who fled the Holocaust to South Australia, have you uncovered any stories of people with disabilities um, and there's an example, a Stephen Silberman, who has written extensively about the history of autism and the controversial work of Nazi-aligned Hans Asperger uh, and the extermination of thousands of children and adults living with disabilities. So some pretty heavy stuff here. But over Yeah, I think for me that was some of the most heaviest stuff when I was doing it was the disabled, the, the approach to basically annihilate, annihilating if you weren't perfect. Um, I haven't cr come across anyone escaping or being a refugee here as such. I would love to find those stories, but I'm not sure how that would come about, but you never know. Things have come out of the woodwork. Um, um, could, could you make, I mean, I, I do find it fascinating that that some of these stories have have come out since since you um, started this journey. Do you, can you elaborate a bit on the process of tracking down those stories? I mean, they're... Well, as you know, Christy, I'm a trove tragic. <laughs> and a lot was just trobing, 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 and then, and then you come across names, you know, throwing in Jewish refugee or whatever, and coming across names then... And then googling them and and then doing ancestry and all the family history and then working it all out and um, there was a lot of that and then putting names out to people in the community mm -hmm. who said have you come across this person i mean a lot of the community the jewish community within adelaide although it's small it they they have they they know the names and to mention so that was another another path 
I'm trying to think now. I, I probably need to track down actually how I did the research. It sort of just it, some days it was just kept. I kept just finding them, you know. And then there was connection, you know, amazing connections or people coming in to the museum and and just leaving their name. And yeah. And the other um, Pauline touched on it. It's quite interesting because there are some people who've made their lives here in South Australia, but have cut off from community yeah. Yeah. and don't want to be engaged with it, but are insisted, insistent in having a Jewish funeral. So that's been a real conduit mm. as well, yes. working and getting information from both yeah. um, synagogues yeah. here in yeah. Adelaide um, and being given family contact yeah. Um, yeah. numbers and, and yeah. those sorts yeah. of things and yeah. reaching out. Um, and, you know, we had uh, someone walked in today with an amazing story as well. So it's oh, just... Wow. Another yeah. one. We're <laughs> Another two hundred now. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I say, the most recent one that I researched was just was the eulogy from the from the um, funeral, and someone would never come across, and it was just an amazing, amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that that there's a question. We're not going to get through all these questions. I'm going to ask you two more questions. Um, one following on from that. I mean. This is such heavy stuff and it's so overwhelming, but it's so important. So there's a question here about, I mean, how do you actually find dealing with this day in and day out? Um, I mean, does the the trauma, the traumatic content, does it, does it impact on you personally? How do you yeah. um, deal with this personally it, it, and professionally? It's, well, yeah, it was, it, I must admit, it was hard, um, when it, especially at the sort of the pointy end of getting the exhibition finished and just having to go through like trawling through so many photographs and um film images to like work out what was going to be just right for the audience but you had to look me personally had to look through the bad stuff as well to kind of judge and how to how to judge that because you didn't want to sanitize it but at the same time you didn't want to traumatize people so yeah and it was I I was finding it a bit overwhelming and you just have to go and think about something else yes do something I think, with. yeah, and I think it's, I mean, we remind our volunteers as well as staff, you know, it's important to be kind to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And to take space when you need it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there are instances where you might be speaking or presenting at something and you just can't yeah. help that personal connection. And sometimes there is a slight breakdown. Yeah. yeah. But, I think most people understand why yeah. that happens. Yeah. Yeah. It is really about self um, self self care and, and and ensuring that you are being kind to yourself. But also, too, for me personally, it's about what then drives me is actually the fact that we are making a difference mm. and that what our mission mm. is, mm. and puts life in perspective as well. Like some of the things that happen it's just nothing compared to what some people yeah. have to go through yeah mm. yeah uh, absolutely agree um Kathy this last question is kind of directed at you but you you might both have some reflections on it it's a nice one to end with um because you mentioned that there are not many survivors left and and that part of the importance is because we're going into this post-survival world and it seems so unbelievable. Uh, it, well, I imagine it will seem so unbelievable if we don't um, continue to remember. But um, so how do you think the sharing of these stories of the Holocaust and the remembrance will, will change and what will it look like in the future? Um, for me, that's where I guess um, museums will play a key role um, and education programs, as well as the use of um, technology. There's been... Um, a lot of um, experiments done with um, um, holographic um, technology recently in terms of people asking questions in a museum environment and a holographic answer by a survivor will, will appear. So I guess it's important to remember those points of, um, of, of empathy, but it is really through um, ensuring that we get as much of the information available digitally so we can actually continue to share those stories, but also to through, um, through our volunteers. Some of our volunteers here have personal Holocaust connections and really also to, like myself, people who do um, have descended from um, the generations to continue to um, pass on this information and to share the story of our families. And for some of us, 
and many of us, the numerous amounts of people in our families that didn't survive. Yes, um, yes, quite again, so just important and, and a heavy note to end on. Look, um, thank you so much, uh, Kathy and Pauline, for generously sharing your time and the, the story of Armsec and some of your own personal stories here. Uh, it's been hugely insightful and I, I'm just I'm so glad that, that you were able to join us for this talking history. So thank you very much. Um, so just again, a few housekeeping uh, things. So just a reminder, this is being uh, recorded. We will have it up on our YouTube and SoundCloud accounts within a couple of weeks. So thank you to the audience for tuning in yet again to another successful talking history. Um, if you haven't signed up to our newsletter, go on to history.sa.gov.au and sign up so you can get forward notice of the next year's talking history season, uh, as well as other uh, bits and pieces from the History Trust of South Australia. Um, we have one more talking history for this year, for 2021. Details of that will be out soon. It'll be held in November during Feast Festival and it'll feature a, a local audience, um, uh, sorry, a local author whose, whose memoir looks at growing up in, you know, the 1970s and 80s uh, Adelaide. So a really good, diff very different, but, but equally insightful, uh, you know, look at, at, at South Australian history. So thank you all. Um, that's it from me. And thank you again to our speakers and to our audience. Uh, and good night and until next time. Thank you. <laughs>